Good morning. Good morning. I'm John Jackson. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to First Prayers this morning. Um, if you happen to be a visitor with us this morning, we'd love to know a little bit more about you. And would, if you could please take a few minutes to sign one of the cards you'll find in the back of the racks, the racks on the back of the pews. Um, you know, I've been a member of this church over 30 years, but I've uh, never heard anybody mention the racks on the back of the pews that I didn't think about the church I grew up in. Every Sunday, it was a very significant part of the service for Steve Creech's grandfather to get help from his seat in the back of the church and come to the front to welcome the visitors. And he would always say, don't remember to sign one of those cards in the racks in the back of the pews. I can still hear him saying that. Maybe we'll invite Steve to recreate that one of these days. <laughs> um, gear up for learning. We uh, accepted the challenge of gathering 2,600 spiral notebooks for Sumter School District. We used to call them composition books. We're well on our way there. We set our date as tomorrow, August 8th, as the deadline for that. So if you haven't participated in that, please do. Uh, you may remember that Richard May was a real leader in that effort for many years. Um, Office of Training. That begins today at 2 o'clock. The first session is at 2 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall today. We'll also have two on the 15th and the 25th at 5. There's going to be a covered dish lunch on Sunday. We're looking forward to that. That's on the 14th, immediately following the worship service. And it's in the Fellowship Hall of the Church. We'll provide the chicken and the beverages. Uh, if you haven't ever been to Montreat, here's your chance. It's coming up in October from 9 through 12. That's Sunday to Wednesday. We'll be leaving on Sunday and uh, returning on Wednesday. It's not a special event, but it's a chance to kind of have a tour of Montreat and participate up there in that area. It should be a beautiful time of year there, too. 200th anniversary celebration, 1823 to 2023. The next meeting of that is August the 16th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. If you'd like to participate in that, everyone is welcome. And please read that narrative on the back of your program. It tells you a little bit more about that. And joys and concerns. Um, these folks we want to keep in our prayers. Wanda Kasker, Carolita Cantrell, John Michael Osteen, and Sue and Chuck are back with us this morning. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Wendy Corbett, Caroline Sigmund, Bill Scobie, and Robert Stage II, who is the son of Marta Stage. Elizabeth Williams, Priscilla Dickey, and Mays DeBose. So keep all of those folks in your prayers for us. If you please stand now and join me for the call of worship. Rejoice, people of God. Celebrate the life within you and Christ's presence in your midst. Our eyes shall be open. The present will have new meaning. And the future will be bright and hopeful. Rejoice, people of God. Bow your heads before the one who is our wisdom and strength. We place ourselves before this God, that we may be touched and cleansed by God's Spirit. Rejoice, people of God. Sing praises to the God who makes all things new. We gather with grateful hearts to worship the living God.
to be seated. If we say that we are without sin, we are self-deceived and we are strangers to the truth about ourselves. But if we confess our sin, if we name our brokenness, if we claim our regrets, then our God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and make us whole again and new beginnings await. Let us celebrate God's mercy even as we confess our sins together using the prayer of confession in our bulletin. Let us pray together. Merciful God, all that we have and all that we are come from you, yet we prefer to focus on what we have done to justify ourselves. We count all that we have done to earn your love rather than confess our need for your grace and mercy. We point to the shortcomings of others instead of examining our own waywardness. You ask us to trust, but we would rather control. You ask us to be faithful, but we choose to be fearful. Forgive us, Lord. Open our eyes to our need for your unconditional love. Help us to journey in your mercy that we might be gentle with others. Free us from our need to justify ourselves and guide us to the fullness of life in Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers, O Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please join with me in our responsive assurance of pardon. May, may Almighty God have mercy upon us and pardon and deliver us from our sins and give us time to amend our lives that the Holy Spirit may be evident in our days. This news gives us new beginnings in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and set free. Thanks be to God. Every day we bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Amen. Other in the faith, to be friends to one another in Christ, and to share peace. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Bless you.
I would like to invite any other children who are with us to please come forward for a word for children. If you would like to do that, you are welcome. Good morning, children. How are y'all doing? Y'all know what this is? It's an iPad. Well, I think everybody here knows this. You know what? This is the first time I've ever carried my iPad into the worship of God. That's how old, that's how old I am. But, uh, but I did it today because I wanted to show you a picture. But first, before I show you that picture, I want to see if you have anything to tell me. Have y'all ever been on a nature hike? What's a nature hike? You go out in the woods? Right. Now, do you, what, what are some things you might see on a nature, nature hike? Squirrels. Bears. They're bigger than squirrels, aren't they? Might see birds. A big bad wolf. Yeah. You're into big, big and bad. Yes. Wow, lady, but ladybugs and gnats and flying creatures and stuff. Butterflies. I have a feeling y'all have really been on nature hikes. You know, Jesus this morning in our Bible passage from Luke's gospel sort of takes us on a nature hike, and he tells us about birds and flowers. Yes, and bumblebees. Let me... Ladybugs. Let me show you what I, I really wasn't on a nature hike when I took this picture. I was driving home from the mountains of North Carolina to Columbia yesterday afternoon, and it had been raining and uh, cloudy, and all of a sudden, across I-26 was a beautiful sight of rainbow. I saw them. I saw one of those. You've seen a rainbow? And it's another thing that's out in God's nature, and it reminds us of our God. Yes. Uh huh. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, this was a beautiful one. It almost stopped traffic, but not quite. We kept going. But um, but anyway, the what Jesus wants us to know. Yes, you had something else to say. You did. Was it beautiful? Great. I think y'all see rainbows everywhere. I'm glad you do. Um, but Jesus wants us to know when we see things in nature that are beautiful, we can thank God, our creator, and we can know that God takes care of nature. And guess what? God takes care of us. Yes. Right. Yeah, you don't want to go around destroying nature. If, if, it, if, the, if the creature is better in nature, we can just enjoy it there and, and not necessarily have to bring it home with us. What, one last comment. <laughs> yeah. Was it about bugs? You like bugs? Good. Some ladybugs fly. We'll, re we'll, we'll uh, research that one. Okay, great. Let's, let's pray. Eternal God, we thank you for all the glorious things in nature. We thank you for animals and flowers, the beauty of a rainbow. We thank you that in all of it, we can sense the creator God who made us and who loves us in Jesus Christ. We thank you. For your love, in Christ's name, amen.
Hear now the first reading of scripture from the book of Psalms, chapter 33, beginning with verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Happy is a nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. This is the word of the Lord. beginning with the 22nd verse. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They never, neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of life, to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God 
so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven? How much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink. And do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of this world that strive after all these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out and an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. May God bless the reading and the hearing of these portions of his holy word. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Charlie Brown is sitting on a little stool right in front of the television watching a show, and Lucy approaches from behind. Is it Christmas yet? She says. Christmas? Good grief, no. It's still February, says Charlie Brown. Lucy pivots and heads out of the room. I live in constant fear, she says that Christmas will come and I won't know about it. When she is gone, Charlie Brown looks straight at us and says, we all have our anxieties. He's right. We all have our anxieties. That's a given. We are anxious people because we, we live in a world that is not secure where there are very few things that are really guaranteed, where the dangers around us are evident. Life is fragile. We might not be here tomorrow, and we are anxious. And because we are anxious, we are prone to worry. A woman once realized that her fears and her worries were literally ruining her life. So she decided it might help to write them down. So she wrote down all the worries of her life. She made a chart out of it. In tabulating all the things she was worried about, she, just, she made these discoveries. She discovered that 40% of her worries could never happen. They're not real. There's no possibility those worries could happen. 30% of her worries were about old decisions that could not be altered now. They simply could not be changed. 12% of her worries were about criticisms she had received from people who live to criticize. Now, people who live to criticize don't know this, but their criticisms are always dismissed because we consider the source. And she discovered that 10% were worries about her health, which only gets worse when she worries. It was counterproductive. And she discovered that 8% of her worries were about real problems that she could have input in involving people that she loved. She wrote down 100% of her worries and found that only 8% really were worth worrying about. Jesus is sort of doing the same thing with us this morning. He's trying to convince us that worrying doesn't help. It's a hard argument to make 
because we live in a world of worry. Jesus is telling us this morning, do not worry. As an act of faith, do not worry. Do not worry about your food, your drink, your clothes. And then he takes us on his nature hike. Look at the birds. Look at the ravens. They don't toil, and yet God feeds them. Look at the wildflowers of the field. Their clothes are more beautiful than anything hanging in our closet. And they don't worry about their clothes. The birds and the flowers, the creatures of this world, they have an implicit trust that the God who created them will care for them. It's simple and it's beautiful. But we human beings add an activity called worry. And Jesus wishes we wouldn't do that. He says, your Father in heaven knows what you need. And therefore, he offers you his kingdom, the kingdom of God, that you might be generous to all who are in need. Luke 12, 31. Instead, strive for God's kingdom. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. My mentor, professor of Old Testament at the seminary I attended in Richmond, John Bright, once wrote, a book in which he put almost everything he knew about the scriptures in it, and he called it the kingdom of God. It is what the Bible is about. Philip Yancey, in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, says these words. We modern folks conceive of kingdoms in terms of power and polarization. But Jesus' message of the kingdom had little to do with the politics of polarization. Jesus' message of the kingdom had little to do with the politics of polarization. Jesus invoked a different kind of power, love, not coercion. The kingdom of God appears to work best, writes Philip Yancey, as a minority movement in opposition to the kingdom of this world. At church, Jesus will not affirm all the news and opinions you hear on TV and in the world. Jesus will give you a different message, a message really that the world has never understood. If you buy into Jesus, you are buying into a minority view. The world will tell you it can't be so. A message about a large, expansive love. A love called the kingdom of God. Jesus reminds us that we need a context for our worries. And that context is to think upon heaven or to think upon the kingdom of God incarnate in Jesus. Someone has said you could sum up everything Jesus taught us in these words. You have a father, a heavenly parent, a God who loves you and cares for you forever. Maltby Babcock is a word, that, a name that I have heard almost all of my life. Maltby, Maltby Babcock was born and reared in Syracuse, New York. He was an athletic young man who showed prowess as a swimmer and a baseball player. He graduated from Syracuse University where he did play on the baseball team. He graduated from Syracuse in 1879 and felt a calling to be a minister, a Presbyterian minister. After receiving his degree from Auburn Theological Seminary in New York, he was ordained as a minister of word and sacrament and served churches in Lockport, New York, Baltimore, Maryland, and New York City. Maltby Babcock did not have an easy life, including the untimely deaths of his children. He and his wife Kathleen had 
two children. They both died in infancy. All his life, Maltby struggled with depression. It ended his life at only 42 years of age. Yet, what we remember about Maltby Babcock is that his preaching and his hymn writing celebrated his trust in God. He placed the worries of his life in the context of a God who rules the earth and a God whose provident care and unfailing love rule the day. Sometimes he would, he would love to go take nature hikes. He would go walking in the woods down by the river, and before he left, he would always tell his wife, I'm, go I'm going out to see my father's world, and he would take his hike. He gave us these lyrics to a hymn that we have known a long, long time. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the fears. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hands, the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king, let the heavens ring, God reigns, let the earth be glad. This is my father's world, that is the context for every worry I have and every worry you have. The treatment for our worry, after we have placed our worries in the context that this is God's world and his kingdom is coming, a kingdom of great love. After we have placed our worries in that context, then we can start working on our worries. And the treatment for worry is to put your mind on somebody else. That's the treatment for worries. It leads to the very generous life. <laughs> I, I never mention, almost never, mention my family in my sermons. But the, who comes to mind when I think of putting your mind on someone else is my sister. My sister Margaret is the most generous person I have ever met in my life. The trunk of her car is full, crammed full, with things that she would like to give to someone else. Things that she has purchased with them in mind. When she goes to the farmer's market, she comes back with bundles of fruit and vegetables for all her neighbors and all her friends and all her teachers at school. She lives with other people constantly on her mind. She is a great recipe for the generous person who would rather think of others than think of herself. Her life is not consumed with worry. But we have to fight it because the world always goes the other way. The world trains us to worry. In the spring of 1979, the sports writer Mitch Alban graduated from Brandeis University where he had to leave his favorite professor, Mari Schwartz. Fifteen years later, Mitch read that Mari Schwartz, his professor, was dying of ALS and would not be with us much longer. So Mitch asked Maury if he could come back into his life and journey with him toward his death. And every Tuesday, Mitch went to see his professor, mentor, friend, and they visited 
about what this amazing man, this professor of sociology, had learned in his life. One Tuesday, they talked about life in America, and this is what Maury said he had learned. He said, we've got a form of brainwashing going on in our country. Do you know how they brainwash people? They repeat something over and over, and that's what we do in this country. Owning things is good. More is good. More property is good. More is good. More is good. More is good. We repeat it and have it repeated to us over and over until nobody bothers to think otherwise. He continues, I tell you, as I sit here dying, when you need it the most, neither money nor power will give you the feeling you're looking for, no matter how much of them you have. They're not up to the task. He concludes, giving to other people is what makes me feel alive as I die. When I can make someone smile who is feeling sad, it's as close to healthy as I ever get. That's the truth that Mari wants us to learn. It's the same truth that Jesus wants us to learn. Giving to others is good for the soul. It's the treatment for our worry. Alice Hazeltine grew up during the Depression in our country. She's written a book, she's edited a book called We Grew Up in America, Stories of American Youth Told by Themselves, published in 1954. In that book, Alice talks about her growing up in a very poor household headed by her mother. She remembers growing up in America, she remembers how poor and generous her mother was. She said, Mother always kept a charity box in which she placed money to give to others in need. What bothered Alice's mother so much was when she was so poor, she didn't have anything to put in the charity box. But that was okay. She contributed what she could. Alice remembers the amazing thing is that no matter how poor we got, we never were poor enough to qualify ourselves for the charity box. It was for others. It needed to be for others. And when we were literally as poor as we could be, when we were hungry, mother would gather up the coins from the box and take them to a family less favored than we. Alice, looking back, thinks her mother planned these gifts for the days that seemed the darkest. The light of hope always shone again when she returned from giving away the contents of the charity box. Put your worries, says Jesus, in the context of God's kingdom. That's not the kingdom the world has taught you. It's the kingdom he wants to whisper in your ear and in my ear. To get in that context, take a nature hike. Go outside and look at the birds and the plants and all the things that our God cares for. You know, this is something I don't do very often, but I do it from time to time. On about Wednesday of this week, I went into Shirley's office and I said, hold the presses. She says, the presses aren't running. And I said, I need to change the title of the sermon. She said, fine. The title of this sermon was The Cure for Worry. And I said, I think I'm, I'm offering more than I'm delivering. <laughs> Let's call it God's Kingdom and our worry. We're going to worry. But the context is God's kingdom, and the treatment is putting your mind on another human being and give to them.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you that you know life better than this world knows life. You know how we can live in ways that honor you and bless others and set us free from over-worrying. We thank you for your love. We thank you that your love is for us. You care for us. Your compassion is for us. You bless us as we bless others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now as an act of faith, let us respond to the word proclaimed by saying what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, you are the creator God. You are the God who fashioned and shaped this world and brought it into being. You are the provident God who cares over all of this world. and You are the one who cares for us. We thank you that you are our creator God. You are the creator God who came to us as a human being in Jesus of Nazareth to become our redeeming God. We thank you that in Jesus we have been offered a different kind of life, a life in the minority, a life that doesn't buy in to the majority opinions of this world, a life that wants to live differently because we have been redeemed and set free. And therefore, you come to us as Holy Spirit to grow us up into Christ that we might say no to what we need to say no to so that we can say yes to the generous life that loves all people. Eternal Father, give us courage to live that life because the world has never welcomed that life with open arms. Every time it causes that life to suffer, even to suffer upon a cross. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we know our God. And our God is the context and the answer to the worries of our life. We wish we could find our worry button and turn it off. But it's so hard to find. But we can give our worries to you. Knowing that your love will not be defeated by our worries. And we can treat our worries by putting our minds on others. For these gifts of grace, for these fruits of the Spirit, we give you praise and worship this day. Eternal Father, we pray for your world. 
a world that is too violent, too rough. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help the wars of this world to end, to cease, that peace might come. Help us to work for peace even as we pray for your peaceable kingdom to come. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we pray for our church. We pray for a prayer of thanksgiving for 200 years of faithful ministry in this place. We thank you for our ancestors and our friends in Christ who have labored in this place seeking to bring your love to Sumter County, South Carolina. Be with us as we prepare to celebrate that milestone and be with us now as we heal our church, as we invite Holy Spirit in, as we decide to be the church we want to be for you. Give us wisdom, give us guidance, and give us love one for another. Eternal Father, we thank you that you are the God who hears the prayers of your people. We thank you for your love that sustains us. Even amidst the worries of our life, we trust you. We give our worries to you. And we give our talents and our monies to others who need them more than we. Eternal Father, we thank you for life together in Jesus. Hear our prayers, prayers of thanksgiving for every healing that happens, every new beginning. Be with those who are sick and those who battle illnesses, those who despair and want to give up. We pray, O oh Lord, for your presence to be with them and your presence through us might be delivered to the places of our lives. And now, O oh Lord, we blend our voices together and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Continue to worship our God as we receive the morning offering. Gracious Spirit, dwell with me, I would gracious be. Help me now thy grace to see, I would be like thee. And with words that help and heal, thy life would mine reveal. And with actions bold and meek, for Christ my Savior speak.
eternal God, our Heavenly Father, your Son Jesus tells us that the kingdom of God is comprised of open-handed people. We thank you for the privilege of being open-handed before our God in worship this day. Accept the offerings of our hands that we might go out into this world and love, that we might place our minds on those who need us and who need you. We thank you for the promise of your kingdom in our midst and your kingdom coming through our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now to the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, help the suffering, support the weak. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.